We're now going to transition to our middle lecture of the day featuring Deva Newman. I'm going to briefly introduce Deva and then pass the baton. So Deva is the Apollo Program Professor of Aeronautics and Astronautics and leads a research group uh, in the Human Systems Lab at MIT Aero Astro. She's the former Deputy Administrator of NASA and as of July, our incoming new director at the MIT Media Lab, which we are all incredibly thrilled about. Deva has received numerous awards, a few of which I'll highlight here. The NASA Distinguished Service Medal in 2017, Women in Aerospace Leadership Award 2018. Deva is a member of the Explorers Club and has an amazing sailing story to tell for anyone who doesn't already know some of her uh, background with real adventure and exploring the surface of our own planet. And she's also a veteran zero-G flyer and a fellow of the AIAA. We're delighted to have her with us today to share her amazing work on aerospace, biomedical engineering, and bioastronautics for human spaceflight. With that, Deva, please take it away. Yes. So nice to, to see you all. Fantastic. And I think you can see my slides as well, I hope. Okay, wonderful. So great. I know some of you, but not all of you. And uh, what a treat to be here with you. Um, I'd love to be teaching the whole class with, with Ariel and Jeff, but I'm, I'm supposed to be on sabbatical, <laughs> but I get to at least interact with you today, so I'm thrilled. Okay, well, uh, let's get started. We're going to talk a little bit about um, extravehicular activity and some technologies uh, that I'd like to highlight, but I actually always, uh, I always uh, like to start uh, with this big, uh, big framing. In terms of exploration, as I mentioned, I am an explorer. I circumnavigated the, the globe on our sailboat. I can't wait to get all of you to the moon. I think it's going to be my students that go to the moon and, and to Mars. Uh, if you know me or anything about me, it's uh, that's the horizon goal, getting people to, to Mars. Um, so we have three fundamental questions. You know, are we alone in the universe? Are there other habitable planets? And what about life? And we are on those three questions and the next step of getting to the the moon is you know necessarily we call it a stepping stone and then again to mars is a horizon goal but i just i just love to frame it in terms of i think that really is a focus focus and those are the even philosophical questions for humanity you know why do we explore and so that's a kind of my answer this is a, that's a beautiful image from hubble and um, that's 3,000 stars that were just formed in that stellar nursery. So that's like the cosmic fireworks to kind of start our uh, high level uh, discussion. And then again, just wanted to share this with you, which I got from, from JPL. But when we talk about exploration, and of course you can see my background and I have the famous you know, um, Earthrise photo, which is, uh, I've been uh, inspired by my entire life. Um, really, maybe it's why I ended, I ended up as the Apollo program professor is just that. I got to see the whole Apollo program when I was a young child. And now what have we done? What have we done? Gosh, in my lifetime with exploration, it's just, it's just mind boggling. The hundred science missions that uh, again in the slide, you can see where we're pretty small, you know, it's hard to find us. There we are, little earth. So that's our, that's our place in the vastness of, of all of our exploration and all of the unknown what we still have to, to find. And then today we're gonna, we're gonna zoom in since I have limited time with you. Um, won't get to talk too much about Earth, I, uh, Spaceship Earth, that's my favorite planet, uh, if you don't know. Mars is uh, my second planet and uh, the moon, I'm, I'm a big, a big supporter again. No, this is the lunar class. So I'm gonna talk actually a little bit about Mars and moon because uh, I actually, uh, they're so interrelated in my mind that you know we've been living and working on International Space Station. I have a whole lecture on that. Come to a, come to the graduate class in the fall on aerospace biomedical engineering, and we can dive into that. But again, putting a, the Moon and, and Mars are very uh, linked in my mind for uh, human exploration and where we're going in the, the coming decades. Um, so so to that end, I want to again just uh, just high level. You you all know this, but uh, I, this is really. Uh, this the sphere, if you will, Earth, Moon, and Mars. I think where where humans will will explore, well, well, humans will live. I do believe will become interplanetary. But if we take a look at um, the Earth, low Earth orbit, getting to deep space, to the Moon, and and Mars, I really think that's uh, the the stomping grounds for for humans, if if you will. And all of our robots and scientific exploration, that's that's beyond. That's to all of the planets and all of the you know. Uh, ocean worlds again searching searching for life and then uh one one more image on 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 mars and I'll get to the moon in a minute but again i just think in terms of framing i actually like to show this i need an update for this this chart this infographic but i 
I pose it because when we explore, you know, Mars is hard, it's far away. And if you take a look at human history, this is the Soviet Union, NASA's missions, and now we need to update it because right now, of course, India, MOM, the Mars Explorer is on, is orbiting Mars, right? The UAE, we have hope, we have the hope observator. So when you look at it, you say global exploration. Uh, I think this is a great testament to that. First, you just try to, you know, fly by. Then you try to orbit. And then if you're really good, you try to land. And, uh, you know, you know, perseverance. Jeff, I'm not sure if you've given an update on Moxie, but um, did you? Uh, if you didn't, I, we might want to take <laughs> two, two or three of my minutes because I'm, I'm on the edge of my seat this morning and I couldn't find the press release. <laughs> the, the press release will not be out until 1.30 this afternoon from NASA. Okay, so uh, I won't spoil it, but this is actually a tribute to Jeff and his team because exploration is about living off the land. It's all about ISRU, in situ research utilization from, from where I sit. You don't get to bring everything with you. So, I mean, you know, again, Moxie is just uh, the best thing going on. So I can't wait for the press release, you know, I won't, spoiler, and hopefully Jeff's given you, you know, a lecture. But again, can we learn to do ISRU, live off the land? Hugely important uh, for, the, for the moon. And um, we're involved in a project called Resources, which uh, I know Cody and, and team members are leading, you know, it's resource utilization. Can we, now I'm on the moon, you know, can we find the volatiles? How much water is there, you know, trapped in ice? What can we do in terms of life support systems and ISRU? That really, I think, is the fundamental question, and especially for today's lecture. So again, I, I uh, Cody, I promised Ariel I wouldn't uh, spoil resource because I know that's a team project. So I'm going to let you all talk about our, our really exciting resource um, team and uh, wait for your, I'll, I'll zoom in for your final presentation as well. But I'll get, I'll stick to EVA and uh, some, some higher level comments. So um, uh, I call these my, my Apollo bloopers. Of course, we have been to the, the moon in my and Jeff's lifetime. So what about that uh, suit that they were wearing? That is Jack Schmidt, uh, here, uh, you know, a scientist trying to do science. We did not make his job easy. Um, you could barely catch a, a sample. Now, the spacecraft, the EVA, the suit, I call the world's smallest spacecraft. It's really a complex engineering design. It has to provide all of your life support, your oxygen, your mobility. But you can see here, you know, that this wasn't a capability um, that we really enabled science. Uh, it was fantastic. It was fantastic for the late 60s and 70s technology. But fast forward, you can see in the middle of this slide, this is the current uh, spacesuit. It's flown on all the shuttle missions. It's flown on all the International Space Station missions. It's called the Extravehicular Mobility Unit. It's about 160 kilos. It's pushing 300 pounds. It's a gas pressurized uh, shell and uh, it's not very mobile. It's, 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 again, an engineering feat, world's smallest spacecraft. It's allowed us to you know, construct um, International Space Station. Just amazing. And then there's some, some different advanced concepts, a little bit uh, you know, more like this, uh, I don't know, it's kind of called a man in a can, you know, different, different, different types of suits that you can take a look at. And we'll talk about, uh, again, some, some of our work. But uh, again, just to talk a little bit about the current, current state from Apollo to where we are, to where we are now. So um, this is a, maybe a better view. I want to show you of the EMU, extravehicular mobility unit that is today's current uh, state, of, state of art. Um, you're on, you're in, it really is for microgravity. So you put your feet in the restraints, you're getting all of your, your oxygen. Jeff has uh, uh, you know, flown <laughs> in this suit uh, you know, uh, many times than his EVA on his missions and um, when you then just to take a, a look at it again, gas pressurized keeps you alive, and you kind of zoom in just as one. It, it's many, many layers. It's actually fourteen to twenty-one, depending on how you count. So if you kind of go from the inside out, first you wear your astronaut long underwear, and that uh, gives a little bit of thermal control. We, we run water through Tigon tubings. I'm not sure if you can make it out right there, and that's just this. Um, it's just a maybe if you're working really hard. <laughs> Um, you know, a really, really active EVA. You can get a little bit of cool water, you know, flow that through. 
uh, it's old technology. It's actually, gosh, 1950s, 60s, UK fighter pilot technology that we, we still use today for the liquid cooling ventilation garment. Again, what's, what's close to you on your skin. And then, then you, you build it out. And um, actually, well, I'll give you, a, I think, uh, you know, one second, one second, hold on. <laughs> this is, uh, I, don't, I, I, don't have, I don't have too many demos here, um, given that I'm not in my real office, I'm at home, but I don't know if you can see that anyhow. I, brought, I have a few spacesuit pieces and gloves, but I'm not sure it's gonna come on with my background. Sorry, just had that ready. Uh, but let me just, hopefully this image works. So then we will build out and all these different layers, like I said, 14 if you count from this picture. So we have to provide uh, a pressure layer, okay? So after the liquid cooling ventilation garment, then, then there's a pressure layer and it's actually a three different uh, pieces of material for a bladder and a liner. And then you, then you uh, move out and you get to a crunchy kind of silver layer that's, um, like uh, is aluminized uh, mylar. So it looks like aluminum foil. And um, there's multiple layers of that. Now that's for thermal control. Now we're talking about the thermal layers of the suit because of the extreme temperatures in low earth orbit for this suit. Of course, when we get to, to the moon, we have the most extreme you know, temperatures on the moon, right? Plus or minus you know, 200 degrees C. So then you worry about you know, how much thermal control um, are you gonna put into the suit? Or your spacecraft or habitat for the for the ambient for the outside temperatures, and then finally the white. You look at the suit, and uh, you know it looks it looks looks white on the outside. Well, what's that? Well, that's the final layer of the suit, the thermal micrometeorite garment (TMG), and that's for what it says literally. Um, any to um, um, if there's any micrometeorites that you could hit you, which there's plenty of them in low Earth orbit, hitting space station, you know, now. And so we want to protect the person. So putting in, and that's uh, some impregnated Kevlar, you know, very strong material. And then, of course, um, the white, uh, again, for emissivity and absorptivity, again, for the thermal and the thermal micrometeorite garment altogether. So that's, um, <laughs> that's a really quick overview <laughs> of the current state of the art in a, in a space suit. And, if you need more information, I'm glad to, to give you lots more on that. It's usually, uh, you know, multiple lectures in, in, hey, in my hey, class. This, yeah, yeah? Uh, I just thought I'd uh, point out that the multi-layer insulation you talk about only works in a vacuum, which means it'll be fine on the moon, but it's not going to work on Mars where we have a, a slight atmosphere. And so that's going to be a whole new challenge for spacesuit designers. This is a class on the moon. so. We don't have to worry about it immediately, but it, it is a problem that's going to ultimately have to be solved. Aerojet exactly. Or like that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And we need, you know, we have a whole trade off, uh, you know, trade off, um, you know, table. Here's low Earth orbit. That's what we know. Um, we, you know, Apollo, we were at the moon and we have to talk about the differences in life support. Thanks, Jeff. And, and as well as the TMG, thermal micromart, you know, garments, what work. And we have to change up the technologies um, for Mars. I'm going to, I'm going to talk a little bit now about, um, you know, mobility a little bit in terms of mobility. And uh, again, we haven't needed that much mobility for, for space station, low Earth orbit. For the moon, it's a different environment. That's why I showed the bloopers. So I'm going to kind of concentrate again how we think about in our research, um, keep keeping the astronauts healthy and well and alive, but in, uh, you know, with using um, different different suits. Uh, again, just an overview. I thought this chart might be helpful. Uh, we think about, okay, um, these are <laughs> the shortest list we can kind of come up with if we think about the human and the extravehicular activities, you know, relationships. And so um, we talk a lot about, this is, sorry about all these acronyms, but, you know, it is now, it's the NASA world. So this is a human research program and EVA uh, physiology. You know, we have to think about how do we keep our astronauts uh, safe and well. And so the shortest list in terms of what do we need uh, uh, to really provide that is is right here. Biomechanics, human factors, I won't read all them all them out to you. Uh, radiation protection, we'll talk a little bit about today. Um, just going through the acronyms in case you're not familiar. This is decompression sickness, DCS, decompression sickness. If you're a scuba diver, any scuba divers online, I hope you can, you can wave so we can interact a little bit on these virtual squares. Um, so gas physiology, you know, gas physiology, um, nutrition, bone and muscle, uh, exercise, all these things. And then the EVA system, okay, what's your, what's your space suit have to provide to you? And um, you can take, again, I'll just give you, you know, 
quick chance to, to look at this. Um, what's the mass of the suit? You need to provide pressure. Now we haven't mentioned yet. The suit, the current suit is only providing 30 kilopascals, actually 27, but we'll call it a third of an atmosphere. And that's, that's fine. That's enough pressure to, to, to live. Okay. So we're in one atmosphere, all of us today, we're in one atmosphere here on earth for the suit to, you know, you only need to provide a third of an atmosphere. So that's our design reference. That's the current capability of the current suit. Now this image, I have changed images here. If you're, if you're noticing, this is the current Mark three, I have a new name. It's the current NASA um, Johnson Space Center suit that is, um, getting ready for to be the next to the X EMU, if you've heard of that, for the moon or Mars. We've been working on this a long time, NASA has, as well as, you know, our lab. This is the suit that's kind of fielded as a planetary EVA suit, the picture that you see here. And it is a prototype and it is a working prototype at Pink, and it produces a third of uh, an atmosphere pressure production. And you can see some interesting hard and soft components. The EMU that I told you about was all you know, soft components, again, a balloon, a pressurized, a big pressurized balloon. Now we have, if you can see some, some hard components, especially at uh, the top of the legs, the thigh, and it has um, a waist bearing, two really important um, things to put into a suit to gain mobility. Now, this is still very heavy and massive, but I just want to point out kind of, again, where the technology is going and what we currently have both at NASA and then talk about some of our ideas. Okay. So, you know, you've had a chance to, to look at all these things, again, just at the basic minimums. Uh, what about, you know, countermeasures, suit trauma countermeasures? Um, actually, the suit injures you. So what can we do about that to keep the astronauts alive? Um, what about leakage? You know, it's a life support system. Like I said, it's a small spacecraft around you. So what about, you know, leakage, things like that, cooling, consumables, need to be have wearable biomedical sensors all over you. Uh, the pre-breathe protocol goes into, you're going to, be in a different environment, an, an oxygen environment. And since you're changing pressures from one atmosphere down to a third of an atmosphere, you literally have to breathe. You have to pre-breathe. You have to breathe um, oxygen in the suit for four hours. Well, that's four hours. The astronauts are not performing their tasks. So there's a lot of cost, both money and time uh, management. Okay, waste management, of course. And um, then we call countermeasures. We're always studying countermeasures. So again, this is a, this is a quick, quick overview. If you're interested in any of these, I'd love to, you know, all of these could be about an hour lecture. So I know it's a, just an overview. Well, we've been thinking about to improve mobility, um, try to, um, you know, think about suits for a long time in, in the human systems lab at, at, at MIT. And so I think, okay, good. Hopefully you can see the video. So we look, we think about the moon and Mars all the time. That's uh, what we're fascinated about. One six gravity, three ace gravity, and we try to simulate it. And we, we and so this is in the lab is our moonwalker. So we'll hang you from the rafters and have you, this is normal motion, of course, that's a great graduate student there. Then an exoskeleton, we've designed lots of exoskeletons to kind of stiffen up, you will, to try to replicate the current spacesuit or the EMU. So this is again, one of Jeff and I have been doing this work for, uh, you know, a couple decades, <laughs> and we're measuring the energetics. You know, someone now, here's our subject, um, we're taking a look at the workload and energetics, okay? And so if we put on an exoskeleton, which is our suit simulator, then how much extra energy, you know, are, uh, do they need to perform? And um, we still need to do a lot more of flying in parabolic flight, as, as well as going underwater. These are all the, the simulation environments that we use. So this is this is underwater, if you can't tell, at a lunar simulation. So it's underwater and the subject is is ballasted to 16G. Now in the Mars, they're ballasted to 3 ace gravity. So we're simulating the moon and Mars to look at that performance to inform our spacesuit design. And then here we are flying in parabolas. So that's a lunar parabola. That looks you know, that looks kind of like normal running, you might say. That, you know, that actually, and I know some of you get to experience that. This is just fantastic. And here's Mars. Mars, actually, that now you're a biped. I mean, Mars, actually, and you use very, very little energy. We have um, lots of papers on this. And I just showed one figure because there's a, kind of a hypothesis there that we're still working on. And 
it'll take a whole bunch of you all, great graduate students and, and folks to, to help us figure this out. So on the y-axis, I have cost of transport energetics and it's cost of transport. And then we're gonna take it, um, it's joules per kilo per meter. So we're gonna normalize it by, by your, your mass, by kilo, and then what distance you're going. And then you can see moon, moon, Mars, and earth. And what you see here, there's, they're suited and, and unsuited, but just, just I just wanna show you this. At the moon, this is your cost of transport. And here's Mars, it's a lower, energetic expenditure. You should say, what, David, you're, you know, your graph is wrong. Because we thought, well, 16G might be here, 3A's G uh, might be here, and then suited. And again, the, the earth is, is a little bit, earth is higher if you look at suited. A lot of subjects couldn't actually finish with the exoskeleton at the 1G condition. So again, we've studied this over the years, but this is the important part. Of, this is why I wanted to show you this data. For the moon, you're using a little bit more energy why our theory is that you're actually one 160 is so so light you're wasting energy you're working on stability control back to the apollo bloopers you are really really light you can jump seven to eight times your height to vertical which is great right we can all slam dunk on basketball i mean the moon is fantastic but it's really light when you get to the mars condition three hg you can all be marathon runners it, it just feels much more natural and you can, you know, subjectively and then quantitatively, it feels it's much easier. Let's say a little bit closer to one G, but you're like, but the moon it, that is one six G is a very, uh, it's a very light gravity loading. So again, we think energetics. And so um, you're using actually, we think, you know, a lot more energy than you than you are. So this is, I don't, I'll go quickly over this. This is great work with Chris Carr. It's, it's, it's older work, but in terms of a spacesuit spacesuit design, we think a lot about biomechanics. What are the energetics we need to provide people in a, you know, kind of making you an extreme athlete, um, not a big bulky Michelin man. And Chris did some really ni nice work in terms of uh, the idea behind you know, all these graphs here is what if we could tune the stiffness of the joints in the spacesuit? Biomechanically, that's one of our, our, our great hypotheses, right? So sometimes, and let's say it's in a, a stiff gas pressurized suit at my knees. Sometimes that might be good if I'm, I'm, I'm taking samples. Again, I'm looking at the volatiles on the moon and maybe I kind of want to stand up, right? So stiffness in the suit might actually be good if I'm you know, kind of working at the lab, if you will. Um, if I'm locomoting and it turns out you, you lope, and you won't do the two foot bunny hop that you saw on Apollo, that was a bad spacesuit design. They had very limited mobility. They didn't have a, any pelvic twist and tilt. So they needed a waist bearing. But so these are all the things that we think about. What if we were really good engineers? We could, I could crank up the stiffness in your ankle or take all the stiffness off. What, could I, what if I could do that to your knees and your hip? If I could do that to ankles and knees, I think we'd have a phenomenal spacesuit capability if we could kind of tune the stiffness of the joints. And um, again, lots more to say about that. But uh, David, wanna what, David keep, one keep, other keep, thing about spacesuit stiffness, you know, even without tuning it, the the, the pressure in the spacesuit right now uh, bears a lot of the weight of the backpack. You know, you talked about how heavy a spacesuit is. A lot of that weight is in the backpack. Yeah, and. Uh, when you pressurize the suit, it kind of likes to stand up on its own. So it it actually takes a lot of the weight of, of the backpack. If if the suit were 100% flexible, it would be like carrying all that weight on your back as a backpack, which which is not an easy thing to do. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's and so that's the trades. And again, so kind of these hybrid suits of the future. Um, and Ariel, am I only supposed to go till 10:15? Yes, but we have some time on the back end. So for between 10, 15 and 11, it's a discussion with you and Darlene. Um, so feel They're free to you know, take another extra minute or so if you'd like to show something else. Okay. And then we can transition oh, I do. I have so much ready. more to tell you about. And so it's just too much to get into a half. Now. I'm going to give you these slides because spacesuit injury analysis, oh, other, other, other great work I wanted to highlight. And I'll, I'll skip to the chase then. I better tell you, I think I better finish up and tell you a little bit. If I could show quickly some of these, these slides. So what are we doing um, can, you know, right now in terms of our, our research? I've been going way too slow. I got too excited about all these possible things to show you about the moon and, and moon and Mars. So much great material. And um, 
So we work on something called the, the, the bio suit that gets some light students are here, but it's basically, and Jeff and I have been doing some mechanical counter pressure. We got rid of the gas pressure and did something pressurized you directly to the skin. We really think a lot about the pressurization. Then we think it's a game changer in terms of mobility and capability. We want to make you like an Olympic athlete. So uh, we map people in three dimensions. You get a custom suit, uh, very custom. We come over to the lab and we'll tattoo you. And we watch your, you know, you in, you're in, you in motion. We're really working right now on putting some advanced materials into the suit. We use shape memory alloys and like, uh, imagine we, we put, we want to give you to a third of an atmosphere, as I mentioned before, that's what all shoot, suits should do. And so you put on a tight compression suit and then we kind of cinch it up. Right now, the promising technologies are um, shape memory alloys or nickel titanium, as well as shape memory polymers are, are, are literally our, our current work today. One of my PhD students um, is working on the, the SMP shape memory polymers. Um, and then uh, Jeff mentioned the backpack. This doesn't look like the, you know, our, our artist conception of the backpack. Don't look anything like, as Jeff mentioned, so the, the current suit, the 160 kilos, half of that is the suit, if you will. And the other half, 70 kilos of that is the backpack. That's a huge mass. That's a huge backpack on your back. So kind of our, uh, we envision something very light, very mobile, more like, a, you know, an extreme camper or, or athlete in our designs. And then a shout out, I'll end on a kind of a shout out to some of the, the current work. Cody has done some, some great work in thinking actually about thermal control, thermal management. Could we design the suit differently? Is it some aerogels and nanotubes? There's Lots more to, that she can share with you on this, but essentially moving from pressure, that's the compression technology, skin tight compression. Now for thermal control, we use a sandwich of polyethylene, aerogels and hydrogenated boron nitrate nanotubes. <laughs> so say that fast. And it's the first time ever, we think we can provide some radiation detection in a suit. You should say, wow, I've never, in all my years of designing suit technologies, I've said, no, no, radiation, sorry, you need to do that in the habitat, do that with other people in the habs and the labs, because don't add mass to my mobile astronauts. And I'm fixated on getting them to be mobile. So no radiation protection. Well, now with lightweight materials, really novel materials that we're trying to invent, we think that maybe we can get some radiation protection in basically the outside thermal man, you know, the thick, that, that white layer thermal micrometeorite protection and maybe some radiation protection. So it's, it's phenomenal work, it's super exciting. And then we also get back to the life support system. How can we redesign it? We do a lot of modeling in terms of taking a look at, um, and this is again, for the moon, the moon environment, um, using some pretty nice um, advanced um, adaptive electronic radiator surfaces and some different things for our carbon dioxide scrubbing. So new technology is basically looking at um, the life support system and the thermal modeling for a mechanical counter pressure suit um, of the future, which we hope to get to the moon and Mars. Okay, so I better end there because I think we're gonna have a great discussion as, as well. And there's more, if any of these topics, uh, you know, like Cody's great work has have, uh, you know, if you're curious, please, uh, please reach out and I'll give you our references and lots more to say about anything I've talked about. Fantastic, Deva, thank you so much. As the class knows, today is the human life support theme day for we've built up all of this technical cumulative stack for what does it take to get to the moon? What does it take to operate on the lunar surface, the power to survive the lunar night? And today is really the, you know, one of the capstones thinking about what does it take to support human life and human operations on the surface of the moon and moon to Mars as Deva brought up. So thank you so much. And now, Deva, don't go anywhere because hey, we're going to transition into the, oh, one, go ahead, Jeff. One, one other comment. Uh, Deva talked a little bit about thermal control. Remember, the Apollo astronauts were, were uh, operating on, on a pretty flat surface. They were in the sunlight all the time. And their main problem was staying cool, uh, which they did by sublimating water, about five pounds of water for every EVA. And water is a very scarce commodity. In the South Pole region of the moon, there's a lot of uh, shadowing because the sun is down near the horizon. Um, we found, uh, you know, on my very first spacewalk on the shuttle, when we went into the nighttime of the Earth and we were pointed out towards deep space, within about 15 minutes, my hands got so cold that I had to ball my fingers up. 
Um, and for a lot of, uh, like when we, when we worked on Hubble, we made sure that we were not pointing at deep space for any extended period of time. The astronauts working around the south pole of the moon are very frequently going to be in shadow. And so unlike the Apollo, where the real problem was staying warm, when they're in the sun, they're going to have to, excuse me, staying cold, uh, they're going to have to have thermal control systems that will keep them cool when they're in the sun, but warm them up when they're working in the shadows. And I don't just mean the permanently shadowed crater, just walking around, they'll be in shadows a lot of the time. So it's going to be a, a much bigger thermal challenge than, than we even than we had during Apollo. Just something to think about. And if any, I'll just add on, if any students are interested in doing some thermal modeling, uh, we have um, some great work by Jeremy Stromming that graduated last year. So he kind of re kind of kicked up at this, this, this image that I'm showing you there to, to take a look at any, you know, you know, take a look at what locations we're going to be out now for Artemis going back to the moon and taking a look at that, that thermal whole body, whole body thermal modeling. 